Welcome to ATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Myself, Dr. Naveen Mohan, HOD of Emergency Medicine at Ames, Kochi. I am Dr. Priti Matthews, first year PG resident. Dr. Shreya, first year PG. Dr. Jarin, first year PG. Today, I will be presenting a case of 39 year old male who presented with alleged history of traumatic amputation to the right ring finger around 2 to 2.5 hours after the injury. Uh, so, on 10 second assessment, a uh, patient was conscious and oriented, airway was patent. Uh, on breathing, patient had a respiratory rate of 18 per minute with a saturation of 99%. On circulation, patient had a BP of 130 bar 90 mm Hg with a pulse rate of 87 per minute. On disability, patient had a GCS of 15 out of 15 with pupils equal and reactive to light. Patient was having a bandaged um, uh, injured wound on the right ring finger and uh, there was uh, no soakage of the bandage which was tied from the outside hospital uh, and uh, on disability patient was complaining of a pain score of 9 out of 10 in his right ring finger so at this point of time we had put a uh, cannula and also we after ruling out any drug allergies we had given injection fentanyl for the patient since patient was complaining of severe pain uh, on exposure, patient was febrile and GRBS was of uh, 105 mg per deciliter. So, coming to the sample history, we had asked the history. So, primary survey is clear. Yeah, yes. <coughs> coming Case of traumatic amputation of right, right ring, fin ring, ring finger. finger. Which is already tre given treatment from out outside hos hospital outside. and referred, referred to, to our hospital. hospital. Uh, so, coming to the sample history, 39 year old patient came with alleged history of traumatic amputation sustained to the right ring finger uh, which accidentally happened uh, while he was trying to pack the Milma packing in a uh, machine. So, his hand went inside the packing machine about 2 to 2.5 hours prior to the presentation to our ER and then patient was initially taken to an outside hospital. From there, uh, bleeding was controlled and the wound was was bandaged and the amputated part uh, was uh, transported along with him in an ice box and then patient was referred to our hospital so okay. this was the uh, history what uh, he had given us and uh, coming to the examination part so after uh, giving injection fentanyl we have reassessed the patient for the pain so patient was uh, still complaining of severe pain uh, and the pain score uh, has come down to 7 out of 10. Initially the pain was 9 out of 10, it has come down to 7 out of 10. So then uh, coming to the examination part, we had removed the bandage which was put from the outside hospital and on examination we could see that uh, there was an amputation of the right ring finger distal to the level of distal interphalangeal joint. Uh, and um, uh, there was uh, bone and soft tissue being exposed. No active bleeding was noted at that point of time. Uh, there was no skin discoloration seen along the margins of the wound and surrounding area. Uh, on palpation, sensations were uh, intact in that region. There were no restriction of movements at the proximal interphalangeal joint of the right ring finger. All the other finger movements was possible and uh, pulsations of radial artery and ulnar artery also was present. Uh, so this was our examination finding. Uh, so initially <coughs> after examining the wound, uh, we uh, patients still complaining of pain. So we had proceeded with the digital block for the patient. Uh, so uh, patient uh, uh, here uh, uh, initially uh, examining the wound, any patient coming with an amputation, amputed part, uh, we can classify based on the examination. How will you transport a amputated? Uh, if, uh, uh, if, if suppose... If you are working in a level 1 trauma center, how do you tra transport? Uh, usually any patient coming to a level 1 uh, center, uh, initially we have to uh, exam uh, ask the patient whether that amputated part was brought or not to the center and uh, if any foreign material is there, we have to remove the foreign material from that uh, part and then... For doctors working in peripheral hospitals, this, this is how you are supposed to transport uh, an amputated uh, part. Uh, and then we have to clean the amputated part with uh, saline and wrap it in saline moist gauze. 
so that part has to be uh, wrapped with a saline moist gauze and then put inside a plastic bag and then this plastic bag has to be put in a container filled with ice and saline so and we should take care that never that part gets exposed directly to the uh, ice and uh, saline and then ensure that uh, the uh, part is uh, labeled and then transported in the ice box Uh, to wherever uh, to the tertiary center where, uh, where plastic surgery plastic is, surgery is available. Uh, available so that is how we transport this is one common question that they ask for your mr come intermediate as well as maybe in primary also i think they may ask but in inter- intermediate it's for sure you'll get how to transport you'll get a uh, around five, four to five options of will everything will appear similar but you have to be very careful what exactly some some will some in some places it will be written moist gauze one one will be written dry gauze like that mm-hmm. so they'll try to confuse you but the exact <laughs> wording should be this is given in arkham learning so this should this one you should be taking care of okay Uh, so this is how we uh, usually transport the amputated part and uh, when a patient comes to the center within 6 hours within 6 hours it has, it has to be, to be uh, transported to a tertiary center mm-hmm. where plastic surgery is available beyond that it won't won't be uh, viable no, viable and then <coughs> initially when a patient comes to our center uh, we have to make sure that proper analgesia is given to the patient patient will be having severe pain what analgesia uh, so most preferred is an opioid drug initial management we prefer morphine or any opioids can be given and even with that if the pain is not getting controlled then we can go for blocks digital blocks nerve blocks can be given for the patient ring block ring blocks okay. can be given in this patient in our center also we had <coughs> given a ring block since after even giving fentanyl patient was having severe pain we had gone ahead with digital block a ring block was given for the patient uh, so uh, about how to give the mm-hmm. ring blocks before that you should know the anatomy <coughs> of the the thing is it's in the ring finger yes it's amputated here yeah distal okay. to the distal phalanx okay. uh, patient oh, had before, before that what is the classification of uh, basically any patient coming with an amputation <coughs> uh, there are two types of classification transverse amputation and oblique amputations okay. In transverse and oblique, oblique mm-hmm. amputation in transverse amputation we can divide into four types in type 1 there will be only soft tissue loss in type 2 uh, there will be fingertip loss at the level of the proximal third of the nail plate type 3 fingertip loss at the level of eponychial fold and type 4 will be fingertip loss proximal to the distal interphalangeal joint so here so four types are there and when now what is the when should this patient be referred to the plastic surgeon that's yeah. a question uh, so when there is a injury of type 2 or higher partial amputation of the mm-hmm. fingertip uh, if, in case of oblique uh, amputation then uh, if the bone is exposed this or is if about the transverse yeah. okay in transverse if it is type 2 or more we have to so only type 1 you can dispose from er itself mm-hmm. so if it is just a soft tissue loss distal to the thing but beyond that every case has to be Referred, referred to a plastic, yeah, referred to a plastic surgeon. And uh, the other classification and, and is and in tran this thing oblique. oblique 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 you we have to classify it as volar lateral or dorsal. Yeah. That is how we classify. And in that case, if there is a oblique fingertip amputation with bone exposure or fracture, then we have to refer to a plastic surgery. Uh, okay. In those Which two cases, can be discharged in oblique. a uh, ob- oblique usually if there is no bony fracture or uh, no obvious uh, exposure of bone then we can discharge discharge from here so no need ER for any consultation no. at all no. right yeah. so uh, in case of uh, transverse type 2 or more and in case of oblique if there is a bony exposure or fracture we have to refer to a right. plastic That's surgery right. and uh, a- in uh, in er basis what we can do for the patient is first we have to give the analgesia secondly we have to uh, take a radiograph of the digit and also of the amputated segment and then uh, we have one point usually people don't do, do do that they don't take the x-ray x-ray of the amputated segment only the hand they take Okay. both we have to take their radiographs mm-hmm. then we have to clean and dress the uh, finger stump with a non adherent uh, dressing and wrap the stump lightly with the sterile dressing then we have to uh, give proper iv antibiotics the preferred choice of iv antibiotic is first generation cephalosporins so that has to be given then we have to give the patient tetanus prophylaxis also should be given for the patient and also um, if the patient has to be referred then patient has to be kept on npo and for the pre op uh, operative procedures patient should be kept on npo because of 
solid and six hours six hours of uh, liquids should be kept okay. uh, patient should be kept on npo uh, and also we should make elevation of Sorry, the affected so two hand two hours for liquids and six, six hours for solids, solids. solids. and what, uh, what pain will be for the pain what would you Opi- uh, first preferred drug is opioid, opioid. and mm-hmm. even if with opioid pain is not getting controlled then we can go ahead with blocks digital blocks can be given for the patient mm. so here in this case we had given for our patient a digital block for this patient okay. so before that the anatomy pain is it has been amputated in the this ring finger ring finger so what are the what is the nerve supply here Uh, we have we <coughs> usually ulnar nerve and the median nerve will be supplying the palmar surface of the hand okay. so lateral uh, medial 1 and 1/2 will be supplied by the ulnar nerve okay middle 1 and 1/2 1 ulnar and 1/2 will be middle. supplied by the ulnar nerve and the lateral 3 and 1/2 will be supplied by the median nerve hmm. uh, so in this patient it was on the, the which aspect palmar aspect palmar aspect and on the dorsal aspect it will be by the ulnar nerve and the radial nerve yeah. Uh, so here in this patient it was in the ring finger this uh, distal to the distal phalanx it was amputated right. so uh, the, it was supply it will be supplied by the ulnar branches digital branch of the ulnar nerve yes so the ulnar goes, now goes like that and then gives supply branch to the medial aspect of the ring finger, ring finger. as well as the lateral aspect, lateral aspect. Of one branch to the lateral aspect of the ring finger also ring finger Okay. So, uh, in this, uh, in uh, the pr- advantages of giving a digital block for this patient is, uh, it will have a rapid onset of action. A very small amount of the anesthetic solution will be only required, and also a single injection is required, and then there will be a uh, very less risk of direct trauma to the neurovascular bundles. So that is why we prefer giving a digital block to the patient. And uh, so, uh, the what about the the cross section? How many? How many digital nerves are here? Uh, each finger will be supplied by four. Okay. Uh, there will be two palmar and two dorsal and uh, digital two branches. Two palmar and two dorsal. Two dorsal, dorsal branches right. will be there. Okay. So you will have to block all these four hmm. digital nerves. Yes. All right. And uh, what is the basic anatomy like? In a cross-sectional view, how how will it appear like? Uh, from medial to lateral, it will be nerve uh, artery and vein. no artery and vein on which aspect from medial to lateral medial to lateral here uh, on cross section cross section suppose this is, this is a cross section but the position is this so from medial to lateral vein artery no like here right? artery. so here this is if, if you cut it if you cut here you will get a phalanx the bone is here Mm. Okay, on top of the bone, you have got the upper upper neurosis. Upper neurosis neurosis will be there. And above the upper neurosis, you have got the nerve, no. medially, mm. then artery, artery and, vein. Then and then the, the vein. vein. Mm. That is on the dorsal aspect, the dorsal aspect mm. of the thing. Palm, uh, all right. But whereas on the ventral aspect, mm. what is it? Below the, I mean. below the below the uh, uh, bone you have got the flexor tendons mm. the flexor, flexor tendon uh, digitorum uh, superficialis flexor tendon proper. as well as the flexor digitorum, digitorum profundus. profundus which goes in between the flexor digitorum superficialis and this flexor digitorum profundus usually uh, is goes and attaches to the distal, distal phalanx. phalanx right mm. and on either sides of the flexor digitorum Digital. flexor mm. tendons you have got the attachment of the nerves the nerves digitorum. but just above the nerve You have got the artery also, so you should be careful not to break the artery. The total four nerves. You have to you have to block four nerves. nerves. Okay. And uh, for giving this uh, digital block, uh, the equipment what will be needing will be a sterile set should be needed. A 10 ml syringe will be needing, and then uh, a 25 gauge needle is what we prefer. The smallest size would be preferring so that there is no much injury to the maid. So 25 gauge is the preferred one. For adults. No, uh, for adults. Mm-hmm. and uh, so uh, i- the technique of giving the blockers uh, in uh, we'll be keeping the um, uh, hand on dorsolateral aspect and uh, we'll be making a small v in- initially we'll have to inject the uh, the base of the uh, base of the uh, finger we'll mm. be injecting and then making a small v right and then uh, the needle will be directed anteriorly, anteriorly towards the base of the phalanx and uh, once uh, it touches comes in contacts with the phalanx then we will be giving 1 ml of the drug and then we will be slowly withdrawing and while you will have, have to pierce the flexor tendon that sheath 
Mm. Left to pierce the flexor tendon sheath, which is here. Mm. You can confirm it by moving the finger. If there is a free movement of the needle as such, it means that it's in the flexor tendon sheath. Mm. Got it? No? If it is in the sheath, if you move the finger like that, that needle mm. will also mm. keep moving. So then you can inject. Mm. Okay, how much? Uh, one ml initially will be injected and then slowly we will have to withdraw the needle and on withdrawal we will be injecting one more ml. Yeah. So that will be giving all of total of a 2 ml. 2 ml. That is the technique of <coughs> giving the block. Mm. Uh, and then... Uh, this is called what is trans? Transthecal trans -thecal digital block. Okay. This is known as transthecal digital block. Mm. And this is uh, mainly given on the volar aspect uh, mm. and it can be also given on the dorsal aspect also. In the dorsal aspect, we will be injecting on uh, both sides of the base here. of the finger. Right here. We mm. will be injecting. Because you have got four nerves. Mm. By injecting, doing transthecal, you will be anesthetizing these two nerves mm. on the ventral aspect. Mm. And by injecting here, you will be anesthetizing the dorsal, aspect. dorsal aspect. The two nerves will be. And okay. okay. And um, uh, usually the choice of uh, drugs that we use for the digital blocks will be lidocaine or the bupuvacaine. Right. And uh, lidocaine, uh, usually the onset of action will be between 10 to 20 minutes. Uh, both these drugs has an action of onset within 10 to 20 minutes. So immediately after giving local, <laughs> you shouldn't be doing the thing. Wait for around 10 minutes. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, dosage of the drug is that if we are taking lidocaine in adults uh, about 12 years of age, the drug should not exceed more than 3 mg per kg. And uh, uh, in adults, it is not more than 4.5 mg per kg. And in children, it is not more than 3 mg per kg. The maximum dose what we can once give. Once more, once more. Uh, in children under the age of 12, the maximum dose should not exceed more than 3 mg per kg. And an adult, it should not be more than 4.5 mg per kg. And if you are giving... That is for plain... Plain, plain lignocaine. And if you are giving with adrenaline, it lignocaine should not exceed yeah. above 7 mg, 7 per, mg kg. per kg. That is one question that they usually ask for our, our NMARC uh, primary exam. The dose for... for Lignocaine, plain lignocaine and the, uh, the with stick. epinephrine. With epinephrine and without epinephrine. The maximum permissible dose. Okay. And in case of bupivacaine, uh, there is only one dosage. It should not exceed more than 2 mg per kg. Whether it is children or adult, hmm. it should not be exceeding more than 2 mg per kg. Hmm. Uh, that Otherwise, you will get all these uh, like lidocaine toxicity and all features. Perioral anesthesia, yeah. numb, tingling, numbness and all these things, arrhythmias, seizure, all these things can develop. So you should be asking whether, whether like every time whether the patient has, is having such symptoms and all, all while you are giving uh, this thing local lignocaine. But, uh, not, but not, but it, this, this one is only one ml is one. being given, so you, you need not worry. But in other blocks, you should worry because if you are giving some facial like a iliac nerve block or for the, in the here and all, no, you will be giving more ml of lignocaine then you should be cautious you should be alerting the patient that the patient will be having these symptoms of lignocaine toxicity and if he develops such a symptom you should stop it immediately and what antidote will be will you be we can give intralipid 20 percent intralipid can be given mm. if there is how much dose how much dose 1.5 mg per kg 1.5 mg per kg can be given. then after afterwards you should titrate it depending on the you can give us some infusion and all 50 ml per kg and all you can give it can give us infusion and accordingly you can titrate until symptoms of toxicity resolve okay. and then the contraindications for uh, digital block if there is any vascular insufficiency we shouldn't go ahead with the digital blocks we should look the capillary refill time before give, administering the block then if there is any local area infections then also we should be avoiding then uh, if there is any um, swelling uh, then uh, the digital blocks can be ineffective while giving to the patient then also we have to rule out the allergies to the lignocaine and bupivacaine we administer these are the contraindications for giving the digital block then coming to the complications of the block uh, on giving we can uh, it might cause an infection very rarely but if given under aseptic uh, techniques then it can cause infection in the patient uh, it can also cause hematoma if we are uh, puncturing multiple times 
uh, in the patient then it can cause hematoma so in order to avoid hematoma usually we prefer sm uh, very small size needle that is 25 uh, gauge needle can be preferred then uh, it can also cause gangrene of the digits that is if we are giving uh, along with epinephrine then yeah. it can cause gangrene to the digits wherever, so wherever there is an end artery you should not be giving uh, with lignocaine with, with adrenaline ep epinephrine so plain lignocaine is sufficient then if the patient has got some an allergy to lignocaine also you should avoid this yes. thing then very rarely it can cause some residual paresthesia uh, on giving to the nerves but uh, no systemic toxicity as such is not noted anywhere so these are the main complications infections hematoma gangrene are the main complications of giving digital blocks uh, so that is about the digital block so in this patient we had given digital block in sh and then uh, we ha we could properly examine the patient's wound and then plastic surgery was involved in for this patient uh, we had also given first dose of antibiotic was given for the patient cephalosporin first generation was given then we had given tetanus uh, uh, for the patient first dose of tetanus was given and then um, this patient was immediately taken up for OT procedure and uh, patient had undergone uh, exploration and flap cover. That is by the surgeons. It's not our job to like. So in for your MRCM OSCE examination, what, what they usually ask in such a thing, what they usually ask is teach a, uh, this thing, first year PG or a house surgeon how to do a digital nerve block. That is That could be one station. Okay. Then uh, <clears throat> counsel a patient regarding how to, like you are, you are planning to do a digital nerve block for these these things and all. Do do counsel a patient. So in that case, we'll have to take a complete ample history and then explain the procedure. Any procedure in an OSCE station means you'll have to cover under the following headings: indications, contraindications, complications. Precautions to avoid complications, what to do before the procedure, including taking consent, ample history, and everything. What to do, do like also the preparation of all required equipment and like drugs and everything. What to do during the procedure, what to do, or what to do after the procedure. Then addressing post procedure complications, and then finally writing down the proper notes. So, all these things will have to be covered. When you when you when you are when you are asked to uh, do a OSCE station on a procedure any procedure, so these are the headings that should be covered because each and every thing carries marks. If they have a checklist here, then they'll be taking the checklist. These these things should be covered. It's not merely the procedure as such. The entire thing has to be covered. Right. Nothing more to. Okay. Thank you.